Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Shane Wolf Show. Today we are joined by Dr. Michael Free. I don't want to leave the doctor part out because you studied <laughs> hard for that bit. A lot of I work. sure did. Yeah, I sure <laughs> a lot did. of work went into that. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And like, how long ago was it that you became a doctor in psychology? Well, so it's actually a PhD in psychology. So, mm -hmm. and I think it was uh 1992 so uh not 100% sure of that but uh, yeah. yeah around around, around around about that time and a long process to get there oh look i took a real long time i took 12 years uh -huh. <laughs> which they actually don't like very much uh the universities they like to push you through pretty fast but i was a uh, you know, I was a married man with young children, so uh, I uh, part time study had, had other yeah did it part time yeah. and working and supporting the family. So I kind of spun it out as long as I could because I would imagine it'd be quite hectic working full time and studying at the same time. Oh yes, absolutely. And and uh, I mean, I was very fortunate. I was working for the the Queensland government for uh, a lot of that time, and back in the day, they gave you. Um, a day off a week for studying. Right. And so, um, so I was able to kind of do it at that, um, using that one day a week for <laughs> such a long time. Right. Right. And, and you've done, um, a lot of things because with your, with your psychology, you've, you've lectured. Is that, is that correct? Have yep. you, you've lectured. You've, you've owned your own practice. Yep. Yep. So I, w I worked for the government for, for 15 years. And then I uh, worked as a lecturer in clinical psychology at uh, Griffith University for 15 years. And uh, then I uh, went into private practice full time um, and did that for, you know, 15 years. And, and what area was the private practice? Like, is, is, I'm imagining that there's different areas in psychology that people kind of specialise in? Yeah, well, the two big ones, of course, are, are children and adults. Uh -huh. So I really worked with adults um, as much as I could. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really a shop front, it was a shop front, you know, suburban uh, clinical psychology practice. And so it was whatever came through the door, really. Okay, right. And that was fun. Is it any difficult working with children than working with adults? Well, one of the reasons that I didn't work with children um, was that I found it very difficult to work with parents. And so I, rather than get frustrated, and I'm normally um, with adults with all sorts of problems, I am a very patient person, but I wasn't particularly patient with, um, with bad or neglectful or selfish parents. And so I just kept myself away from that, yeah. from that territory really. And is that a case of you having a professional opinion about something and then them just basically thinking you're wrong and, and wanting to do their own thing anyway? Well, more that they weren't prepared to put the work in, you know, okay. as a parent. They weren't prepared to put the work in. They kind of expected uh, that you, the psychologist, or me, the psychologist, would do all the work and fix the child. Uh, and that's... Not the way it works, even though I'm not a, uh, a you know, a super experienced child psychologist. But yeah. Anyway, that, that was why I stayed clear of that particular thing. But I found that um, I could work very well with um, adults and particularly men um, across the across the spectrum of sort of social, social and cultural groups and, and so on. Statistically, is it more um, uncommon for men to visit psychologists, or is it pretty much? Even? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, that's no. that, that's the historical stuff. That that in general, women are much more likely to see medical people, see psychiatrists, see psychologists, see mental health practitioners, practitioners, and so on. So, so yeah. So, in fact, if you were. Um, if one was a, a psychologist who got on well with men, then that uh, was a very good thing in, in, the, um, in the area in which I was working. Right. So, um, I mean, if you're, I mean that, that's 
really a, a little gold mine if you're good with working with men, isn't it? Because well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, they would have to feel comfortable with you know. I mean, a lot of people go once, but if they don't feel comfortable, they don't come back, do they? They, they go oh, one, to, one, to three, yeah. one to three times and they go, oh, I, I, it's fine. I've, yeah, I've and got I'd this. Like to, yeah. <laughs> like, mm, I don't know if you do. <laughs> and I'd like to say that probably most of the people, once they came along and saw me, they kept coming. Yes. Yeah. Well, that is a very positive Until outcome. they got better. Yeah, that's a very, yeah, well, that's the... And then they disappear. I mean, that's the, the end result, isn't it? The end result is that you don't have to keep coming back, right? Like, that's... Well, that's yeah, exactly. Optimum exactly. result. You hope, you hope. Yeah. And lots of people, they, as soon as they get functional and better, they would, you know, they, they, they would stop coming. And I go, oh, I wonder what happened to them. You know, and then I might hear later from a friend or the person who referred them, oh, they're doing fine. They just stopped. They were fixed. So they, yeah. so they uh, just went on with their lives. Well, that must make you feel pretty good about oh, what it's you do. It's a very rewarding it's a, it's a very, very rewarding mm. uh, profession. So 12 years, you did your degree. Mm. Oh, 12 years, I did it, my PhD over 12 years. I already had um, what's equivalent to an Australian master's degree in clinical psychology, oh. which is in fact a, um, so I had, because I trained in New Zealand, I have a, an MA um, in psychology and a diploma in clinical psychology, which is a kind of strange um, mixture of things that, uh, that, they, that, that that's, but that's the professional qualification in New Zealand. Um, and at one stage it was the British system as well. Uh-huh. But in Australia, they went down a, a slightly different route and created um, clinical master's degrees. Would you say there was a, an advantage in Doing that over a longer period of time because you have time to digest the information, process it, uh, research it, um, rather than having to rush through in the normal time of a PhD. What is the normal time of a PhD? Is well, like they, 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 want, they want you to do it in um, one and a half to two years, yeah. full time. Yes. So I was part time. I don't know how anyone could do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, look, it's, I, don't, I don't think many actually do, no. but that's, that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I would think over doing it a long period of time is advantageous. Well, yeah, I certainly could think about it. And, and uh, I mean, to some degree, I probably did three PhDs because I collected lots and lots of data. And then I just used the bit that was, you know, told, mm. the, told the best story, really. Yeah. And that was some advice that I got was to, to, um, to tell the best story. Do you, you remember what your PhD subject uh, topic was? Oh, yes, I, do. I can. Yeah. Yes. So I, my, my PhD was on depression. And uh, back in the day, there was this kind of belief around that there's two kinds of depression, biological depression and psychological depression, and then they were different things. And uh, that was sort of feeding through to um, doctors, uh, GPs in particular, uh, saying, oh, well, you have a biochemical imbalance. Uh, you just need to take these pills and uh, uh, you, will be, you will be fixed up. And I sort of uh, had some problems with that as an idea. And so I said, well, of course, you know, uh, we, we are psychological systems and we're social systems and, and we are um, biochemical systems and, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me it's much more likely that all of those things are intermeshed and um, affect each other. And so that was really what I was looking at. And so my PhD was really on showing that treating people with cognitive therapy, which is a kind of therapy, uh, actually changed measures of their biochemical functioning. So... Uh, I was part of a team with um, one of the uh, pathology um, analysis groups in Brisbane and uh, they analysed the data and basically that's what I showed, right. was that as people got better from cognitive therapy, there were some changes in their uh, urinary um, chemicals, for want of a better word. Is that right? Yeah. So, so basically I showed that and um, 
Interestingly, uh, it was replicated by uh, another student of my, my supervisor from University of Queensland. So she, she replicated um, my findings and some, a few other people around the world also replicated that. And, uh, but then it became a non-event, really, since then. Um, people just understand that we are systems and that, of course, you can um, change your biology by changing aspects of your psychological functioning. So to the point that I just read this morning on um, LinkedIn that uh, one of the Ivy League universities, um, Harvard, I think it was, they have just published a study which shows that um, if you have a belief that your illness is purely biological, that tends to disempower you. I think that's my reading of it. Mm -hmm. And so in effect, what people were doing back then is was actually disempowering people and probably um, making, them, making it harder for them to get better. So uh, whereas, um, and I reviewed the literature way back then, so I don't really know what the literature is now, um, but probably there hasn't been too much that's been done since. Um, and the treatment of choice um, back in the day was the antidepressant medication and some form of psychological talking therapy of which cognitive therapy was one of the popular kinds uh, at the time. So um, that's, that's really still my belief is that uh, there's lots of good treatments for depression out there and they are both um, medical and psychological. And one of the greatest um, uh, shames is when people do not get uh, or do not avail themselves of all the treatment options mm -hmm. um, that there can be for, for depression. Um, you know, that, that, that um, well, as we know, suicide is a, is a major issue uh, in our current society. Mm. And I just think, well, did they get everything? Did they get everything that they could have? And so um, that's very much my message to people who are depressed is, you know, pursue the best therapies that you can, the, um, the medical therapies and the psychological therapies, whatever they are the ones that are considered to be the best uh, right now. So, so, I mean, from 1992 until now, there's been huge developments in, in psychological studies. Um, did you have trouble keeping up with everything that was going on in the last 30 years? Well, uh, no, <laughs> yes and no. Um, Obviously, when I was practicing, I uh, made an effort to keep up and went to lots of conferences and and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when I was an academic, I had to. That's part of being an academic is keeping up with your area of of study. Mm -hmm. Though I did actually move out of depression and went into um, uh, post traumatic stress disorder, was probably my area of study um, as an academic. Oh. But uh, and then as a clinician. Um, tried to keep up with the, um, the latest findings. And probably I would say that, um, well, I'm talking about uh, probably five year, up to five years ago, I would say that 50% of what I learned in my psychological training um, has changed. Yeah. But the other part of that is that 50% is the same. Yeah. So, yes, and there's different sort of slants and so on and so forth. I, I think that's a lot though, right, 50%? Oh, like, yes, you know? which means that you do have to keep up. Yeah. I mean, if 50% of music theory changed, I'd be like... Thank God it's been the same for hundreds of years. Yes. <laughs> I've only had yes, to learn it once. Exactly, yes. <laughs> but, th but, well, you know, um, I'm a bass player. I learned to be a, uh, a bass player back in my teens, mm -hmm. which is a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's 50 years ago now, and, uh, or even more than that. 
And so back in the day, we didn't do slap bass. That's, well, um, that's right. Just as an example, that sort of, True. Tarp, you know, played a bass with a pick True. and, and fingerstyle bass. Mm. Uh, never, I was never taught fingerstyle bass. So, I mean, mm. that's a thing mm. that has changed. That has evolved, yeah. Our power chords, you know, yeah. there's, there's, there, mm-hmm. is, there is evolution in mm. music as well. Mm. Probably on the, um, <laughs> yeah, on the performance side, yes. Yes, on the, not on the theory side. Not on the theory side. The theory still remains. I yeah. believe. Um, Got the wrong else? person here, you know. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, my singing teacher, now she, she has done her master's degree in um, music uh, pedagogy. Yes. And so, again, there's research being done there, mm. which I know nothing about, of course, mm, okay. but I'm just saying it's yes. there. You yes, know. true. Very true, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you were involved in that too, weren't you? Once upon a time, I was a music educator for four, seven to ten years. Yep. Um, mm. But it's been that was another lifetime ago. Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I much more enjoy doing this now. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is fun. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed the transition from um, ac- academic teaching to private practice too. Yeah, it's not to say I didn't enjoy teaching, hmm. particularly when I started at Griffith. It was it was just starting out, and we built the clinical psychology training program there. Hmm. And so being at the cutting edge and being pioneers was fun, and I did really enjoy supervising. You know the um, the 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 professionals of the next generation. That was that was that was good too. So the one to one supervision work I really liked, but I can't say I, f- I found. Uh, teaching classes, challenging, I'd have to say. Mm. I mean, I did when I first started teaching, but then after a while you just, you are just teaching the same thing every year to a different group. So then it, that's where it doesn't become, or well, it didn't become challenging for me. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I had everything already set out, ready to go. Um, there was just, oh, it's week five again, term two. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that, wasn't, that was this. not the case in teaching <laughs> right. um, clinical psychology at postgraduate uh-huh. level is that, again, because so much is changing, you need to uh, mm. you need to change every year, mm. you know. And I, I would rewrite my lectures every year. Yes, studying psychology has changed throughout the years. There's it's different now is from when you studied back then. Is that right? M- more the the structure or the way the profession is organised or the qualifications that you uh, need for the profession. So, I mean, back when I started, um, just just to give you a couple of examples, there was no registration of psychologists in New Zealand, Uh um, which is where I train. And in Queensland, where I came straight after my um, qualification, they'd only just been registered for a, a couple of years. There was no code of ethics for psychologists in Australia in 1981. That dangerous. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, so, that's, so that's basically what it was. And uh, um, in Queensland, there was no training program for clinical psychologists in 1981. And so, in fact, I, was in, I became involved um, in setting up the uh, Behaviour Research and Therapy Centre, which is part of the University of Queensland's um, training program. So when they got a, a training program going, um, which was in about, must have been about 1981, they set up a clinic and they sort of pulled in sort of senior practitioners from um, the various hospitals and community clinics around the town and got us to help with, with training their postgraduate students. So uh, some of whom have now retired. <laughs> mm. Those very first ones I um, have, have now retired. So uh, that's how long ago that was, 1981. So, yeah. so, so that was really just the beginning of postgraduate training um, in Queensland. And then sometime later, uh, we... Uh, and when I say we, I mean the psychologists in the public sector realised that we were not getting enough trained people coming through. So we lobbied Griffith University to set up a second training program in Brisbane. And uh, 
and I eventually became came to work on that course, which was which was which was fun and good. But uh, so that's that's so then we had two programs, and uh, there's now three programs because QUT also has a uh, a training program. And so what actually happened um, in Queensland and in some other states of Australia is that people could become psychologists after a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. So, and for a long time, there was these parallel sort of um, pathways to, you could become, you could uh, do a four-year degree and then go out into into work and uh, you'd usually be mentored or supervised by somebody um, to, uh, before you could become fully registered. Um, but I think that that is now closed off and so that the only way you can become a clinical psychologist um, throughout Australia is by doing an accredited uh, clinical psychology training program. And some of those are uh, master's degree programs, uh-huh. some of them are uh, clinical doctorates or course- coursework doctorates and then some of them are, are PhDs uh, in clinical psychology. So, and I think that the clinical doctorates may well be being phased out in a lot of places too. So you really will eventually just have the two options. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the the uh, PhD program um, has a much larger research component. Yeah. So they do they do basically all of the professional training that you do in the master's degree, which is primarily sort of academic and practical. And then you um, do your research uh, on top of that. Yeah, which sounds like a lot of work. Well, it is a lot of work, yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, the whole idea of psychology is that that, um, psychologists are scientists, practitioners, and so they... (laughs) they, um, are trained to to do science, uh, to think and to think scientifically um, in their work, and really to be consumers of science as well. You know, to keep updating themselves and be critical in in reading the reading the, liter- the literature and applying it to their their situation. Mm. So I have a controversial statement to make with you. I want, I want to know your opinion on this. I mean, the first part of it is something that my um, university lecture told me, he, he said this, the statement of those who can't do teach. There is the statement that those who study psychology study it to study themselves, <laughs> work themselves out. How do you feel about that? Yes. Look, I mean, have I, you heard that before? I have heard that before. Right, yeah, good. Um, <laughs> that was put back, put to me in my training. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> right. So, probably had the same uh, lecture, didn't we? And... <laughs> Uh, look, it's it's like a lot of things. It's both true and untrue. Uh-huh. Um, uh, that that would be the case for some people, mm. uh, and it's probably true to say that uh, people who um, study psychology or who are interested in psychology are more prone to um, mental health issues shall we say, mm-hmm. but that may not be a bad thing mm. because that perhaps goes on, perhaps some speculating goes along with sensitivity and mm-hmm. um, and being aware of people around you rather than forging your way through life with, with blinkers on or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, look, I think, I think that, um, and also it is helpful, very helpful to a therapist to have some curiosity about oneself you know, because you are uh, a factor within the room. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are certain people that I know um, that I don't have a lot of tolerance for. <laughs> and uh, the sooner that I pick that up in a client and say, look, I'm sorry, I can't help you, oh. um, but here's somebody who might, Gotcha. the better it is so there for are them. Some doctors who will deal with like more, I guess, well, for lack of a better term, more difficult patients. There are some people that will, some doctors who will specialise with that. It's, it's not so much a matter of difficulty, it's a matter of fit. So that's an important thing too. You know, <laughs> if you're going to a counsellor or a psychologist, <laughs> um, 
that the, probably one of the most important things is you, you get on with them, yep. and that there's a there's a fit, and that yep. that that's not necessarily um, if you don't fit, it's not necessarily a criticism of either you yep. or the um, counselor or psychologist. It just mm. means that there are things about you that that are going to impede um, the progress you make. But if you find you're with a counselor that you trust and that you get on with. Mm then um, you uh, are much more likely to make progress. And that's the same for that's the same for GPs, of course, and teachers of all kinds, you know, yeah. seeing yeah. teachers. That's right. That's <laughs> seeing right. teachers, for example. Yes. Um, and uh, or your GP. Um, I get on very well with my GP, and so I will do what he tells me. But <laughs> <laughs> previous GP, not so much. All right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, that's so that's the thing. If you if if you're looking for somebody, um, if you if you, it's 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 okay to shop around mm. and find somebody who you like, who seems knowledgeable, who mm. you think you can work with. I guess the delivery of the information, like mm-hmm. you know, everyone's different about how they approach that. So yeah, yeah. yeah the clarity of the of the difficulty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I've been seeing a few specialists in recent times, and and. Um, uh, some of them, you know, the clarity of the communication, you go, wow, that's so good, what you told me just then. That's yeah. so usable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Hi, welcome back. Thanks for liking. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for the gifts. Thanks for everything. We're here with Dr. Michael Free, psychologist. Um, are we allowed to call you a psychologist? Well, I guess yes, look, I'm a, I'm a, an, I am a registered but non-practicing psychologist. Ah, interesting. Excellent, excellent. I have a question to ask you about um, my... No, not about myself. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I have yes. a question. Um, we, we just spoke about um, those who study psychology, study it to, to, to work themselves out. You know, you, you have this governing body over... All psychologists, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, you, you have the registration board, which is now national. Right. So, and that's the same for... But that's what, relatively new, right? Like, oh, well... well relatively since my, years. Not, not Well, we had a, um, a Queensland registration board um, from, I think, the late 70s. Oh, okay. And then... Uh, I think it was the early 2000s, we moved to a national uh, registration board for a number of the health care professions. Um, so, so now we have a, a national board of, of psychologists. Yes. How do you get the stamp of approval or the, uh, sorry, um, we're not going to approve you? Like, is there some sort of process that happens? Well, I mean, you've, you've got to jump through the hoops um, of one kind and another, um, and that includes the academic qualifications, of course, and the supervised practice, and people have to be signed off on uh, competencies as, as, part of, as part of that process. So, uh, so you need a fair amount of diligence to get through that. Um, mm. Because I imagine not everyone could get through that. Not everyone could get through that, but the other part of it is to get into a clinical psychology training program, um, it's quite rigorous and difficult. You know, like, I mean, the, 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 the selection ratio is, is, uh, is quite low, so it might be... Um, so they only it, it might be one in ten or something right. like that. I mean, it, di- it differs for different programs across the country, and, of course, the, 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 the more desirable program gets more applicants. So probably the most important part of it is the selection process. So, yes. so to get into clinical psychology, uh, you have to get through the selection process. Right. And so that's, that's um, probably... So there's only X amount of um, availabilities, say, per year. Oh, yes, exactly, um, yeah. Y- Loads of people would apply for it. Loads of people apply. Yeah. A very small percentage of them actually get um, accepted. Is yeah, that- and then they get um, pretty rigorously uh, supervised and assessed as part of that process. And so that's probably where the main gatekeeping, as it were, 
occurs in clinical psychology. Of course, people who have not um, done that and have done the, the four years um, training plus the supervision, probably the gatekeeping is not as rigorous. Um, but you're talking pre-1980, well, whatever. But right? there's still a lot of those people. There's still a lot of those people around. Right. Yeah, so there's, there's still a lot of um, four-year trained people. And, of course, some of them are super excellent. I've worked with mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. lots, lots of them. Um, but they are not as um, – uh, and, and, and many of them will have educated themselves mm -hmm. very, very well. Mm -hmm. But they're not as rigorously educated as people who uh, have gone through a clinical psychology training program uh, I would say probably in the next ten to twenty years, and none of those people will be around. They'd all be retired. Yes, right? that that will that will be occurring. Yes, that will be occurring. And one of the things that I actually did at one stage review um, the supervision tapes of both um, clinical graduates and four year trained. And uh, one of the things I noticed about this was that. The, the four-year trained people would be working within an area of psychology practice and they would tend to be giving more cookbook step-by-step -step instructions, whereas the people who've been trained in a postgraduate uh, program tend to give more theoretical uh, hmm. uh, and more open-ended and, and help the... Um, supervisee to consider theory so you know so so and again that's that's pretty much reflected in the way medicare works so in medicare you've got uh focused um uh, psychology services and the theory would be that they were given by um the less extensively trained people and then there's the more clinical psychology um specialist services mm -hmm. uh, in practice that didn't happen but it's still the concept there mm. and and so um, that's what I would I would say to people and always do say to people is that if you have a complex mental health emotional problem then um, do seek out a a clinical psychologist mm. because they will be able to be more creative in general mm. um, and be able to apply theory, whereas the um, four-year trained people will be um, will be good in their own domain, mm -hmm. but probably not inclined to be as as um, creative or innovative um, as the people who've been trained more extensively. Which again is what you would hope for. You'd hope for that there's a benefit from training. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so if you teach people more theory and you um, uh, you supervise them more extensively and and um, uh, more closely, then you you will actually get people um, that uh, are able to apply their skills and their knowledge in, in, a, in a wider and a more innovative way. I think that's a, a really important point and I don't think a lot of people would know that. No. no. Well, that's exactly. They wouldn't. Like they, just, they, just, they just think a psychologist is a psychologist. A psychologist and they're all the same. That's yeah, right. yeah. And, and again, look for, look, look for um, people who say they specialise in an area because, again, that's the nature of the universe or the medical universe. Now we go to specialists. So we don't just go to an endocrinologist. We go to an endocrinologist who has a specialist in diabetes, if that's what our, our issue is. Mm -hmm. So seek out that kind of information. So as I said, my, my area of um, expertise was, well, depression, but also post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. So uh, that would be something that people could send to me with be people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So, uh, so yes, if you've got that sort of thing, um, find somebody who specialises in the area and has extensive qualifications in the in the area would be my my strong suggestion, mm. and 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 I think a sensible suggestion. I think it applies across the board. You know, I guess one of the hardest parts 
for perhaps some people in need m- might be that they don't know that they may need, I guess, like they, they might feel like something's wrong or but not know like where to seek those answers. Like, you know, a lot of people might not even know where to start, you know, how do you find a doctor? I guess, well, you just, you just Google it or you go and see a GP, don't you? Yeah, you go and see, you go and see your GP. And you hope you have a psychologically minded GP. And again, that's some of them are and some of them aren't. Right. You know, so um, some of them are very sort of mechanical, biomechanical, but that's the starting point. Find a GP who is psychologically minded and start talking about Hmm. the issues and start again taking control of your own life and uh, Mm -hmm. asking to be referred to a clinical psychologist Hmm. or a counsellor. I mean, again, it's horses for courses. Yes. You know, um, it's if you've got a a problem of making a decision about your career or something like that, probably a clinical psychologist is is overkill (laughs) for that. You know, Uh, a good counsellor would be the right person. Mm. So, um, Mm. so yeah, so chat to your GP uh, just as you would if you had diabetes and you wanted to know what you, who, to, who to go and see, you know, which, which of the people and work, work with your GP. It's good advice. So not just a psychologist, but an author. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So um, uh, three books there. Um, the green one in the middle, Cognitive Therapy and Groups, um, that was actually the therapy that I did as part of my PhD. Uh-huh. So obviously I needed a therapy to see whether getting people to do cognitive therapy would actually change their biochemicals. I needed a fairly standardised therapy. So I wrote that therapy there. And uh, that's what I gave to the people in my, in my study. So that was the, that was the first book. And then um, I got some feedback about it and uh, I, uh, so I ended up writing and also the publishers asked for a second edition. So this one here is, is the second edition of that uh, first book. So totally rewritten, a much better book in my view, right. <laughs> but the, Ooh, yeah. the green one sold a lot better. But that's, that's the nature of, of things with um, second edition. So, uh, right. so basically they, they, they are psychoeducational programs for um, treating depression in groups, but they can be kind of um, uh, used to treat individuals. And, and in my individual private practice, I used my own stuff um, mm-hmm. out of, uh, well, latterly the, the, the uh, second edition book um, on a, you know, a weekly basis I would have used bits of it. So mm. I just used the stuff out of my own book. Mm. <laughs> so, mm. uh, um, and, the, and these books are basically for people who are psychologists or psychotherapists? Yeah, well, for, yes, for psychotherapists or psychologists. I think that um, a lay person um, could get something out of or a person suffering from um, an emotional disorder could get something out of the book by reading it through because it basically consists of a series of um talks or bits of information and exercises to take you through doing the therapy. So uh, there's, there's lots of, um, there are lots of self-help books that are structured as self, self-help books, but at a stretch, that could, be, that could be used as a self-help book. Now, the thing is, I would say, um, as I said before, everyone should, um, if, they're, if they're suffering, ideally, they should go to a competent therapist that they like, that they think they can work with. But um, if for whatever reason they find that difficult, then a self-help book or there are actually online programs now that, mm. that people can, can access and um, they may find that gets them started or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so... Um, 
and it gives them a resource that they can actually talk maybe to a therapist about too. So, yep. I tell you, like, you know, um, I'm sure there's plenty of YouTube channels on how to change the oil in your car, but I will still take my car to a mechanic because they know what they're doing. Oh, yeah, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so if I would just go to a therapist mm. and, like, they know what they're doing. <laughs> like, you know, make sure you find, like you said, a good one that that you get along with and uh, let, them, much, let them do their job. <laughs> it's much better. It's much better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and then the last one. Um, so uh, uh, I'm a practicing Christian and I'm actually married to an Anglican priest mm-hmm. uh, who is also a biblical scholar. Mm-hmm. And I came across people when I was doing my therapy with them who uh, seem to have strange ideas about what were the teachings of Jesus. Uh-huh. And so I thought that the teachings of Jesus are not um, well uh, explained or communicated uh, or accessible to people in that sort of situation. So that's why I wrote that book was to actually use somewhat of a biblical scholarship approach to look at the teachings of Jesus and uh, see how they related to the sort of issues that you see in clinical psychology practice in which I would treat with cognitive therapy. So, again, that's how I created that book as a resource book um, for, 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 um, for ther- for primarily for therapists um, who may, may not have a big knowledge of Christianity who are treating Christians. Yes. So that was, that was the main point of that. But I've also uh, known of um, uh, of therapists who've just given the book to their client for them to, you know, obviously quite well-educated clients, okay. um, to, to have a look through and see whether that, that is helpful for them. And for some it will be and some it won't be. But, you know, again, it, it, it's, um, it, it does enable people to, um, as it says, reconcile their faith. Um, so look at the issues that they're having in their lives, the issues that might be causing or maintaining their emotional distress, and look at what's probably an important thing for them, which is the, the teachings of Jesus, and, and put them together in a way that is, that is um, hopefully useful mm. for them, you know. And, and I think there's enormous potential for... Um, for the teachings of Jesus to be found useful um, for somebody who's suffering from depression or anxiety, for example. And one of the biggest ones is that um, that people who are depressed often feel worthless. Mm. That's their kind of core belief, I am worthless. Mm. And just at a very simple level, one of the things that uh, I think Jesus said is all people are of value. Mm. That's what he communicated in his words and deeds. So if, they, if people can actually start grasping that from their studies of the Bible, then that's obviously going to feed into their, their belief in their self-worth and hopefully change it so that they can start feeling that they, they are valuable and valued and worthwhile. And, and so those on. beliefs can be changed. Like, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. That's what you do in cognitive therapy. Yeah. You change those beliefs. Yeah. Which changes the chemistry, apparently. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's something I learned today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. With your studies on that, if that is changing your chemical balance, would that change, like, the chemical balance of your offspring? It wouldn't work um, on the biological level. Yeah, yeah look, yeah, I'd have to speculate on that yeah. and say that's a long haul <laughs> on your offspring. But yeah. in the sense that we know that um, children of depressed parents are more at risk than children of emotional disorders than children of non-depressed parents. So if you actually... Um, can treat people, make them non-depressed, then 
they are going to be better parents and in that way their offspring are going to be positively affected, which of course is super obvious when you think about it, but you know. <laughs> it is super obvious, but I feel that when people are in those positions, they don't really think that way. Well, they don't, but they, I don't think they realise the importance or that the benefit, how how the benefits flow. Mm, no, that, I you know, think that, I that, that, that. That, that, that the benefits flow from you getting your own depression or anxiety treated, how that benefit is going to flow to your offspring. Mm. Yeah, and they probably don't get that quite so, quite so easily. Yeah, because I think if they did understand that, they would do something about it. Yeah, yeah. As people do. You know, people will do a lot for their children that mm -hmm. they wouldn't even do for themselves. True. So, I mean, yeah. that's a, a strong motivator yeah. for people is to, is to, um, is to, is to uh, improve their functioning um, for the sake of their children, which a lot of us try and do. I mm -hmm. mean, myself included, you know, mm. <laughs> tried to be a better parent than my, <laughs> than my parents were, not that it's necessarily bad, but, you know, uh, we all try to be better parents. Yeah. yeah. So how is retirement treating you? Well, retirement is, um, is wonderful, actually. And interestingly, um, because I walked away from the profession, because to some degree I have to, because I'm no longer registered, I can't practice at all and can't even be involved in supervision. Um, I have had to look elsewhere to, uh, for my, uh, uh, enjoyment and stimulation and so on and so forth. And so, um, cause obviously you have a, thirst for knowledge. You've been a, an academic most of your life. Mm, I mean, um, yes. So yeah. it's not the kind of thing you can switch off really, is it? Not the academia, no. Um, and so I'm still actually, so I've actually got three major areas uh -huh. in which I'm working. Um, one of which is the music. So I said when I retired, I was going to learn to sing. Yes. <laughs> so I'm doing that and doing some singing over mics and, and, and things like that. Uh -huh. Um, uh, and I am doing some um, artwork, mm -hmm. which again is just kind of accidental. Um, so you've brought some of your artwork here with you and you also sell your artwork, is that I right? I also sell my art. So I actually go to the Sanford Valley Markets uh -huh. um, on the uh, second Saturday of the month mm -hmm. and I set up my little tent with my artwork and I play my guitar and sometimes my friends come down and help me sing and play guitar. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, my artwork's for sale there. Mm. So, yeah, and also if somebody saw something they liked on there, they could, they could message me and, and work out some way of, um, of getting the, well, I'm sure the you, artwork. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm post. Uh, or post to be the main thing. And then, of course, um, you can do FPOST, transfer, that mm. sort of thing. So, of course, yeah. You know, not, yeah. That, not that difficult. Links will be in the description. Um, it'll um, go to, to you and they can contact you directly for the artwork. And, um, and it's great that you have them on display on your Instagram also. So we'll be sure to link that in the description. They can get right to you. And um, the books, where would they find the books? Uh, the book, books are actually available uh, from Amazon. And I think they, well, they can be bought on Amazon as um, hard copies and they can also be bought as Kindle. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Is there an audible coming up soon? Are you going to read it to us at once? There. <laughs> I don't think that would work exactly. I mean, um, you know, again, if 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 um, if I was twenty years younger, and 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 I'd probably be looking at doing something like that. Maybe we can get a celebrity to, to read it for us. Mm. Matt Damon's in town. <laughs> he was here for the Echo. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matt Damon. Yeah. Read it out for Audible. For the, first, for the first one, I actually did videos, um, uh, which are now being destroyed. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much more to talk about. We have to get you back. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Free, for joining us. It's been very knowledgeable. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on. Oh, good. It's been good to be here. Please like, subscribe, and um, check out Michael's links. They're in the description. Thank you. Thank you.